here, so it's always interesting to see how many people carry it to the very end of the day. So uh, <laughs> it's great. It's great to have. Uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, welcome um, to to our session on uh, the trading of the green hydrogen and its role in bolstering Europe European uh, security. I will frame it briefly. I'll be uh, your uh, well moderator and. Uh, presenter uh, for a few minutes uh, for the day. My name is uh, Alexei. I'm a senior principal on RMI Climate Aligned Industry Team, leading our hydrogen initiatives. And you know, as part of, uh, of the portfolio of initiatives that we have, we have a pleasure to serve as a secretariat of the initiative called the Green Hydrogen Catapult, which is essentially a platform that we've created to scale up. Uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, globally. Um, we've set it up with uh, with the high level champions before COP in Glasgow. So it has been. I mean, the platform has already been uh, around for a while, almost three years. We've got a number of uh, active, uh, very active uh, front runners companies that are developing uh, green hydrogen and you know focused on the green hydrogen. Hence, the green hydrogen catapult. A number of them. Uh, well, you see on the screen uh, um, Alex Hewitt, Gene, uh, and his team, Claire, here. Uh, these are the companies that are members of the Catapult. We have more, such as H2 Green Steel, ArcelorMittal. Um, on, 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 on the demand side, we have some other producers, like the ones from this region, Aqua Power, um, and so on. And the idea is essentially to of the catapult is uh, support the company companies and members to get to 45 gigawatt of um, uh, installed electrolyzer capacity in this decade, which means that final investment decisions on the projects that uh, our members are, are leading should be made uh, by the end of 2027. So these projects could could be built and deliver, right? Uh, I'm glad to report that we are doing quite well. Um, uh, you know, in terms of moving towards the target, we've just before this COP we have aggregated all the numbers from from the members of the catapult uh, to see how are we moving towards the 45 gigawatt target. We uh, we have 14, roughly 14 gigawatt of projects which are in advanced phase, either in you know have already. Uh, taken final investment decisions such as Aqua Power's project in Neom, which is the largest final investment decisions that have been made in the uh, green hydrogen industry uh, this year, 8.6 billion uh, dollars. Uh, um, so uh, that's the late stage, or you know the project in 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 the feed stage we also consider to be late stage. So that's 14 gigawatt, and then we've got. Another 44 gigawatt sitting in the pipeline, which are in the earliest stage, which are still doing, you know, feasibility studies and so on. So that's that's where we are. I, I think uh, I wish you know the rest of the industry was you know somewhere in in in, in this space. But uh, look, you know, the catapult unites front runners, so that's I think is a good explanation that we are we are moving well towards the target that we've set up for for ourselves. Um, I'll. Um, I can briefly introduce the panelists uh, now, but then I think will be good uh, as we will move into the discussion for them to, to tell a bit more about what they are doing um, and, um, and and their angle, of course, uh, to, 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 the, to the discussion. So we've got Alex Hewitt here in the front row, who is the CEO of CWP Global, but also the chairman of the Green Hydrogen uh, Catapult, um, so uh, leading leading the group. Uh, we've got also Claire Bihar, who is Chief Commercial Officer with the High Store, uh, ambitious American uh, uh, green hydrogen storage developer uh, in, 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 in Mississippi. But Claire will, will tell more about what she is doing. We've, we've got Jean uh, Jibolis, who is the CEO of, of the World Energy, that is really a front runner, front runner when it comes to sustainable aviation uh, fuels, and but also developing a big uh, ammonia and not just ammonia project in Newfoundland, in, in Canada. Uh, we've got Susanna Moreira, who is executive director of uh, H2 Global. Um, and finally, we've got Carla, who is a, with the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Policy um, 
and climate policy uh, of, of the Netherlands. So the idea, you've got the gist, we want to cover different angles uh, in, in this discussion when it comes to, uh, to the role of green hydrogen in, in, in European uh, energy security. So this is, uh, this is a barcode, by the way, if you would like to download the report that we will be uh, discussing um, today. The report was published uh, on, on Friday, so I'll, uh, of course, present some key insights from, from, from this report as part of the framing, but um, I highly encourage you to download the report itself and then, you know, read read the narrative and recommendations and you know the analytics uh, which is there so why, why did we why did we do this report um, and why you know we decided to focus uh, on Europe I think it's wouldn't be a surprise for anyone to hear that Europe is when it comes to uh, to creating the market and creating the demand uh, for green hydrogen is a front runner and will be uh, will be the main market if we if you consider the international trade for for quite some time, and the reason for that is simple. I think, uh, well, simple and complex at the same time. Um, I think Europe has been, of course, uh, a leader in energy transition for quite some time, but in the past couple of years in particular, after Russian inv uh, invasion of Ukraine, Europe has set up the ambitious Repower EU strategy uh, with very clear targets of where uh, Europe uh, needs to be uh, bo in order to both win itself off the Russian gas by 2030 and you know uh, have a greater energy security but also to deliver on its decarbonization targets right so this is a symbiotic relationships between these two strategic goals that have put Europe in this uh, leading position and of course in terms of the targets we know that Europe tries to balance domestic production of green hydrogen and you know produce 10 million tons of green hydrogen domestically by 2030 but also import 10 million tons of green uh, hydrogen and Europe was very clear about this that this should be renewable uh, hydrogen uh, in addition to that Europe uh, has put you know forward uh, some um, some stimulus packages that we will also discuss at this uh, panel and you know, uh, in addition to the carrots, which you know U.S. is also providing, has provided some sticks in the form of mandates for industry and, and uh, in, in in particular 42% uh, target of for what are called renewables fuel of uh, non-biogenic origin uh, by 2030. Right. So that that sets the framework where you know the. Companies that operate in European market, but also companies that are looking at European market as export destination, have a high degree of confidence. I think to consider Europe to be the main market for for hydrogen, in at least in in, in the near future. Um, I'll start with with our analysis. But I really want to keep this brief. So this is this is our analysis that show that Europe. Uh, uh, and we did it, as you can see, country by country, uh, cannot meet, you know, most of the European countries cannot meet their 2030 uh, targets. If you calculate demand and you apply that 42% target through domestic production only. That's why uh, most of the European, uh, European countries will need import in, in this decade and beyond this decade, but I'll, I'll talk about it uh, later. Um, this is a slide which essentially is, um, is, 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 is showing uh, our analysis on how different uh, supplier countries uh, or potential exporters are, are positioned to, to serve e Europe with, uh, with, with renewable hydrogen. And we looked at the essentially two parameters here one which is a landed cost of uh, landed cost of hydrogen uh, in Europe and the 
other parameter uh, which is important in our view is is the degree of readiness uh, of, of certain countries to uh, to export because uh, well export requires many things to to be in place including infrastructure including um, in, including other things and it, I think it will be fair to say that many countries have already been in these rates for some for some time like for example Australia was very clear already a few years ago that uh, uh, Australia sees itself as a, a exporter of uh, green hydrogen in, in, in particular so there has been developments there were projects in pipelines I'm sure Alex will, will, will tell more about that um, Saudi Arabia, uh, as, as, as I highlighted, you know, Neom is, is, is already, uh, you know, happening and, you know, going into construction. Um, so you see some, some, some ranking in that regard, but you also can see uh, then, you know, the, the, the economics and, you know, the relative positioning. And you can see that countries like USA, for example, or, you know, more specifically US Gulf Coast uh, producers, uh, while before uh, Inflation Reduction Act. They were somewhere in the middle of the pack. Now, with Inflation Reduction Act, they moved, you know, there to the left, and uh, the the economics is is is, is very favorable, right? Um, so that's that's the economic aspect of this. Uh, this is the um, essentially, um, you know, our our take on on on, on the. What is what may happen here in the longer term beyond 2030 in terms of of the export? And here we looked at the differential between the cost, uh, landed cost of hydrogen, if it comes to import, and the domestic production in different geographic locations in Europe and different ports. And ports tend to be the industrial clusters, right? So there is a lot of demand sitting around, um, you know, uh, let's say Port of Rotterdam or Port of Antwerp. Bruges, there are big industrial zones with lots of, of, of demand in there. So essentially what this analysis is, is showing is that uh, in, 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 in these places, uh, in, in the 2030 time horizon, you know, the price differential is, is, is quite big, right? Two to three uh, euros. With time, it starts diminishing. Why? Because, you know, uh, our analysis show that uh, while well, Europe will be delivering you know, its ele direct electrification targets, and with time, you know, um, as the build out of uh, power will be uh, scaling uh, up, you know, it will it will be cheaper. And Europe, just like as any other region, when it comes to domestic production, will benefit from overall cost reduction. So. Uh, it will be cheaper to produce domestic uh, uh, hydrogen domestically, but still, you know, that differential stays there in 2040 and in, in, in some places, as you can see, even beyond that. So we are not talking about short term, you know, price arbitrage and perspective here. There is a longer term play here that, you know, in our view justifies, you know, this uh, quite complex export import, uh, you know, uh, projects and, and, and agreements. Um, Start wrapping up here. I think this slide is really to show the carbon intensity of blue hydrogen because I think it's important to to address that. In in our view, it's very important for Europe, and I'll show on the next slide the economics of blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen, uh, where blue hydrogen is more favorable. Now, I mean, has more favorable economics now, but. In the long run, as we understand, blue hydrogen, you know, don't bring you to net zero emission scenario. And therefore, in, in, in our view, this is super important to be crystal clear that Europe shouldn't lock itself in in a, in a blue hydrogen because you can see here the emission profiles, which are quite significant. Um, you know, particularly if you would look, for example, at the U.S. Uh, production and take, you know, the average, um, you know, carbon intensity of, of, of that production and uh, do this on the life cycle emission basis, factoring in transportation costs. But, you know, the most important driver there will be uh, the methane leakage on the upstream side. So U.S. average is, is not good, 1.5 percent. Many countries have this kind of averages in terms of the leaks. 
you factor all of that in and you see that dotted line which shows you know the European requirements set for what can be defined as a clean hydrogen somewhere between three and four kilogram of CO2 per, per kg and you see that for many producers it will be super difficult to meet that threshold with having you know high methane leakages on upstream side even if they go for a very high capture rates of 90 percent uh, plus that that's that's a challenge right so to wrap this up this is this is economic analysis that you can also find in the report that shows that yes uh, the economics of imported blue hydrogen right now looks better uh, but it's pretty flat curve right while the green hydrogen economics when you, you see two lines there you know you asked we singled it out because in in our view and as I've shown in the, on the previous slides this is a low cost lowest cost um, uh, potential supplier um, you know uh, doesn't doesn't quite you know there to compete directly with with blue hydrogen but we are again talking about very different carbon intensity and therefore very different product here uh, but with time green hydrogen uh, you know just on pure economic merits will be competitive with 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 with, with blue hydrogen right so uh, I think the message the key message on this slide is that you know there is still support required to, 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 to close this gap if Europe wants renewable hydrogen, but in the longer run, you know, these investments will, will, will uh, um, you know, pay out in terms of uh, bringing Europe to the better energy security situation and, and, and you know, uh, and in line with its net zero emission uh, targets. So that's, that's pretty much all from me in terms of uh, of the uh, framing, and now I would like to uh, really invite the the panelists uh, to uh, to the stage, and uh, hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion. And I encourage uh, all of you to participate. So we've got. Uh, well, maybe I maybe I should go to that last slide with a. Oh, you wouldn't see it. Never mind. Uh, we've got Claire here, uh, Alex, Jean, Susanna, and Carla in that uh, order. And I, as I promised, I would let them to introduce what their companies are doing as part of their and, and their organizations as part of the response to the first question, which will be. Well, we'll start with the producers, probably with Claire, Alex, and and Jean, and uh, you know, if you could say uh, just you know, few words about you know your companies and how do you balance between as you are developing the projects between you know how in, uh, domestic demand creation or targeting domestic demand and how you think about domestic demand in general. In, in the countries where you are developing your projects versus you know export opportunity and how big export opportunities in your uh, in your business strategies so maybe let's let's start in this order Claire the floor Excellent. is yours good afternoon everyone Claire Behar chief commercial officer at high store energy high store is a renewable hydrogen hydrogen storage company uh, and our first project is in Mississippi due to the unique geology and geography Salt cavern storage provides both the scale and the reliability that we will need to have these heavy industries transition off of fossil fuels to a renewable zero carbon solution. And when we think about energy security, we think energy storage. And salt cavern storage is not only the lowest cost solution for storing large quantities of hydrogen, it is also the only commercially available solution today for multi-day, multi-week, and seasonal energy storage. And to, to answer Aleski's question, well, first, I love the analogy of the marathon. And I will say, you know, High Store and members of the Green Hydrogen Catapult, we're sprinting this marathon. And it's because we have this window of opportunity where 
assets, whether it be a steel production facility or a maritime vessel. This window of opportunity to make the decision to move to the zero carbon green hydrogen solution or fossil fuel is is closing. And if we miss this opportunity, we now lock in a 20, 30 year fossil fuel asset. So the sprint is real and specifically in the United States, what the 45V clean hydrogen production tax credit has done has catalyzed both domestic demand and also uh, international demand. Uh, but what's key to catalyzing this demand is going to be uh, customer confidence customer confidence both in product definition, so to ensure that they are truly getting a zero carbon solution, and confidence in supply. How can you make that switch if you are unsure if that large quantities of hydrogen supply will be there? Thank you, Claire. Thank you. I've got my own, thank you. Speaking about marathons, I somehow got from the other side of the green zone to here. <laughs> My gosh, this side is enormous. And you've got to factor in whatever the distance is times at least 1.5 or 2 because you are going to get lost on the way. Go around a few other buildings, meet a few people anyway. Um, hey, Alexi, congratulations on the report. Great stuff. Those numbers are good. Um, it's good to see some nice graphs. Um, I saw some from your colleague this morning on the on the shipping side too. Another good report by RMI. A little plug for you. But um, <laughs> and of course they are the administrators of the uh, the green hydrogen catapult, which I have the honour to chair and along with members here. Um, hey, let me just come out with some numbers uh, to give you a sense of scale. Um, the catapult is a bunch of people, some might say crazy, really going for green hydrogen in a big way. And collectively we've said we will get to 45 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity by FID 2027, correct? Correct. Right. So what does 45 gigawatts of electrolyzers actually produce? Do some quick numbers. It's around about 6 million tonnes of hydrogen per year. Green hydrogen needs an electrolyzer to go pass the water through and make green hydrogen. Hence the metric is an interesting one. Um, 45 gigawatts of electrolyzers is probably about 9,500 gigawatts of power. You roughly double it. So that means somewhere they've got to have 100 gigawatts of wind, solar, maybe a little sprinkle of hydro or geothermal in there. This is mind-bogglingly big. The European Union has a target of 20 million by 2030. Mm -hmm. Enormous. So when you talk about 10 million tonnes, it doesn't sound very much. 10 is a very small number. 10 million is a bigger number. But once you start to try and figure out what that actually is, it's massive. And I think what your report shows is that, A, the task is enormous. B, even with 45 gigawatts of collective capacity from the catapult and throw in a few others that aren't in the catapult, we're still going to struggle to get there. C, with that amount of generation, domestic or indigenous hydrogen, if that's the word, uh, in Europe is going to be hard to achieve. So even the 10 million tonnes in Europe is going to be a struggle because it's going to be pulling electrons from the grid which will be trying to feed the rest of the demand in Europe, which includes existing demand, replacing coal and fossil fuel demand and incoming mobility and industry. In other words, a huge appetite for renewable generation over the next ten, eight years. And, and, and that's going to set a marginal price for electricity, which is the key feedstock for an electrolyzer for hydrogen, which means the cost of that hydrogen is going to be very expensive because it's grid connected and the grid wants to, has a lot of demand. I think this, this, this is what your report is showing. And that was that nice little curve of countries like Germany and Italy, France was in there, they were 1 to 1.3 million tonnes of hydrogen in their demand. Okay, I'm going to come back to some other numbers because it's really hard to get your head around this. We've got a project in Australia which is the 
will be a 35 billion US dollar project eventually. This is not normal renewable scale. We call it renewables at an oil and gas scale. And that oil and gas scale means, hey, we need a big brother oil and gas guy with a big balance sheet, so we brought BP in. They have 40% of the project. But that $35 billion project, when it's fully built out, and it'll probably take 15 years, will produce 1.8 million tonnes. 1.8 from a $35 billion project with 25 gigawatts, which, if it was built today, magically, out there in the desert, would be the largest power project on Earth, bigger than the Three Gorges Dam in China. So these are huge numbers, and that's what Germany needs, that's what Italy needs, that's what France almost needs, a bit shy of that, all by 2030. Okay, so the task is big. <laughs> I haven't even introduced my company yet. <laughs> CWP goes for scale. We're doing a lot of these big projects. The Australian one's the most advanced. We've got six others. Our thesis is that the global south, where there is incredible wind and solar, which is the key ingredient for green hydrogen to make it cheap. And by the way, it's not all in the south. There's great sites in the northern hemisphere as well, but more remote sites at scale will be absolutely needed to take us through from the later part of this decade right through to 2050. And we're going to be chasing a, a grossly undersupplied market for a long time. Enough said for now. Oh. Over to you, Jean. I think you just called me crazy, and uh, I think you're right. Uh, so my name's Gene Gabolas. I'm the CEO of World Energy. World Energy's been around for a bit over 25 years. We started out in the advanced biofuel space and uh, have evolved and, and have continued to evolve and, and push. We, we typically, as, you're, as you point out, we go into markets that don't exist, and, and so, um, so this one is, is perfect for us. Uh, but. Um, so our, our, our big initiatives right now are we operate a sustainable aviation fuel plant first generation in Los Angeles. We're in the midst of a very significant expansion of that facility, a $3 billion investment. We're working on our next plant in Houston, Texas. That one hopefully will come in closer to two. Uh, and, um, and we're exploring how we go from, the, it's pretty interesting, the, the mix between first generation and, and potential e-fuel next generation in co-located uh, operations. We're early stage exploring that. But on the, on the way to the dance, what we figured out in sustainable aviation fuel is that we don't sell fuel, we sell decarbonization. And so in the, in the uh, journey to decarbonization, we had to figure out how to decarbonize the hydrogen we use in our, in our production process. And that got us down the road to uh, uh, working with our, our uh, uh, partners at, at um, Air Products could we bring in product from Neom? Well, the answer is no. You can't bring in product from Saudi Arabia into, uh, into Los Angeles efficiently and effectively. But it got us down the road of green hydrogen. And that led us to, uh, uh, my partners are, are based in, in Atlantic Canada. We're very familiar with the resources there. And we started looking at Atlantic Canada as a place to, that we could produce green hydrogen. And I, I would chalk up a good deal of, of where we are today with this project to be pure luck. Uh, but we have lucked into a fantastic resource on the, on the west coast of Newfoundland. And, uh, and the, the, one of the amazing things about this resource is it's offshore quality wind onshore in an extremely thinly populated area that where they want us. And they want us at scale. And so we've been allocated four gigawatts of power's worth of, of crown land already. Uh, and we, have, we, we operate in an area of the province in which there's almost limitless space to expand. So we could go, you know, the numbers are huge. I know uh, you've, you guys have looked at it. The numbers are huge. I don't know, pick a number. Is it 10? Is it 15? Is it 20? Uh, it, the expansion potential there is enormous. So we look at this project not as a project, but a, as a generational initiative that will just keep evolving and evolving and evolving. The first stages of this supply are you've got to get it to demand. And where's the demand going to be? It's going to be in Europe. So, uh, so I'll, I'll finish the introduction with just that. Yes, you're right. We're crazy. And we're thrilled to be uh, the newest members of the Catapult. And thanks for inviting me, Alexi. Thank you, Jen. Oh. And
No, I think no. I'm gonna have to this is a gig in Should be working. Uh, in the meantime, I mean, Susanna, maybe. Hello. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. I think it's um, probably a slightly different also question in terms of the framing for you, I mean, as uh, as an organization, right? I mean, most of the people, of course, New Age to Global, but while you will be describing what, what you are doing, maybe you could also reflect on their, like, how you see the role of import in the European energy security, obviously that's H2 Global mission to enable uh, that and, you know, where where are we standing in, in, in your view in terms of creating that demand in Europe? Because I think some of the findings in this report have shown that there is some more work to be done and not just in Europe, but I think the three big areas that we've highlighted, uh, not surprisingly, one of the three was demand creation. The other uh, big area uh, was around, you know, certification and the need to harmonize the certification when it comes to international trade. And the third one was essentially on infrastructure, right? And the need to uh, invest into the infrastructure, but also create a policy clarity uh, or regulatory uh, clarity uh, when it comes to, to infrastructure development. So if you could reflect on any of this and uh, same will we'll, we'll, we'll go for Carla when she will present, that will be great to, to start us off. Over to you. Uh, thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Susana Moreira. As he said, I just recently joined H2 Global. Uh, I'm executive director there. And H2 Global, for those that don't know it, it's a market maker. Uh, it c came about an idea that two people um, designed while they were living in Brazil and thinking of ways of trying to create a market for clean technologies. And they started with uh, clean hydrogen. And they do that uh, by a double auction system, which is then combined with the intermediary called Hinco. And that intermediary enters in contracts with both the buyers and the sellers of the project uh, products, which um, are hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives in this case. And then they're... Uh, use funds that come from government institutions, could be eventually from philanthropy, and that uh, funds, uh, funds are used to compensate for the difference between the cost of uh, the producers the, that they are producing right now, as we all know, at a cost that is higher than the, comp the competition, which is the gray hydrogen. And they also sort of compensate uh, the difference with the willingness to pay from the part of the buyers. So buyers uh, are more reluctant to to pay uh, more for the, the hydrogen products, the derivatives, for a question of competition, etc. So that the money comes in and tries to bridge that gap. And the idea is to create, uh, um, help create the market by establishing these connections between buyers and sellers, trying to identify the price, bringing some transparency into the system, and in the process really help a, a normal competitive market emerge. And I think it's different from other solutions out there, like Contracts for Difference, for example, because one of the key elements is that you have this double auction system, where you have auctions on the side of the, the supplier, so you will try to get the lowest uh, price that they can offer from in terms of the supply, and then you also have a competition on the buyer's side. So that's sort of a difference from other systems out there. Um, and in terms of what is uh, what we see is, first of all, we, we are created um, as an instrument, it's a, we consider it's like a public good, and it, obviously the first supporter was the German government. They provided uh, 900 million euros for the first auction, which is currently ongoing, and that was focused on three hydrogen derivatives. Um, they have also earmarked another significant amount of money, around 3.5 billion euros for future auctions. Um, but we also are in talks with other governments that are interested in using this mechanism to ramp up either their domestic market or also their um, you know imports or exports so both exporters are looking at ways to support their industry but also uh, importers from other regions of the world are interested in using this as a, as a form of bridging this gap and helping c create this this uh, market um, ultimately I think we need to really bring a lot of scale to to this because what we uh, are observing is, is that you know 900 million euros sounds like a, a lot of money and it is, of course, objectively speaking. But you know, if you divide it over 10 years, over three products, it's actually 
not that much money. And for some of these projects that were presented or discussed, for them to become bankable, you really need much larger scale. So um, definitely there is need for additional funding to come into the, this type of mechanism or something similar, but clearly there is a need. And we were very happy uh, that uh, a few weeks ago um, there was a, a, an a agreement, which is not yet the final agreement, it's sort of an MOU stage, I would say, between um, um, us and the, um, the Dutch government. So the Dutch government has expressed interest in contributing to additional um, auction in, in combination with the German authorities. So we are very happy about that because it, it helps us to sort of show that this can be brought to other governments in other spaces. So I think I'm happy to take questions uh, if, if any uh, may emerge, but it's a very interesting space and there is a lot that needs to, to be done here. And um, in addition to infrastructure that you mentioned, Alexei, I think uh, the other key uh, point is, is really uh, the demand side and aggregating that demand. We see that uh, from our work as of now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm Carla Robledo, working at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy of the Netherlands in the hydrogen team, and then leading the activities on international co cooperation with mainly Latin America, US, Canada, um, and also in multilateral uh, organizations like the Clean Energy Ministerial and the IEA Technology Collaboration Program. And I'm happy to be in the panel with crazy people, because these are the people that we need and the companies that we need to go into this uh, hydrogen in the Endeavor. We are doing all our best from the public and private side uh, to get this market going, but we need to do more. Um, and uh, yeah, within the Netherlands, we have a very strong and clear strategy on hydrogen. And we were one of the first countries to develop a hydrogen strategy. We see, we saw it was a logical step going from natural gas to hydrogen in the Netherlands, especially because of the earthquakes with the natural gas in the Netherlands, which made the situation not uh, safe anymore for uh, citizens living there. And then all these infrastructure that comes obsolete, we made a study, we said, okay, we can reutilize a lot of the gas infrastructure and knowledge, uh, people working in the gas sector. Um, so we decided we will have, we will support the infrastructure, uh, breaking that problem, the chicken egg problem. Okay, if there's no infrastructure, there are no producers, no consumers, and otherwise. Um, and by uh, supporting also the production side. So scaling up uh, electrolysis, our target is four gigawatts in 2030. And then in two years more, uh, um, trying to go to six to eight gigawatts. And this is because we also need to wait that the offshore wind farms come online. So this other part of the entire chain, it's very important. We cannot just go out and say we want, uh, of course, we want a lot of more uh, electrolysis, but uh, you have to be also realistic. Talking about realistic, this 20 megaton <laughs> target of the European Commission. It's a nice ambition, but we will never be there. And we have to be realistic of the ambitions we're talking about. Uh, and it's a good push forward. But uh, um, the way, the the point where we are, and the 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 the, um, the supply chain constraints, uh, this is not just not feasible. Um, so yeah, we're, we're also from the Netherlands having a very much pragmatic approach. What can we do? Uh, we can put all this uh, infrastructure developments. We are developing the hydrogen backbone. There are uh, around uh, 1,200 kilometers of pipelines where 80% is reutilized. We're developing the salt caverns to have a storage of hydrogen. Uh, also by 2032 to have four uh, salt caverns. Uh, and this is the base where we want to connect producers and consumers. At the moment, we have around one megaton of uh, hydrogen being consumed in the Netherlands. So that's a good start with existing um, hydrogen. Uh, from your report, we see that actually we don't need imports. But uh, our view is that uh, imports will be on the long term very much needed. We don't have the space, the requirements to produce all the hydrogen that we need if we also look into new applications. So if we look into aviation, into maritime, uh, we need to also power the, the power sector. We need to uh, expand our import capacity. So we are also preparing the infrastructure to receive the hydrogen 
hydrogen flows. Um, and now the, the, direct, the discussion is going into the demand creation and where are the off takers. So we've been very much concentrating on production side, on the infrastructure and getting everything ready. Uh, but uh, uh, we understand that the producers need more certainty on the off takers. Uh, so, and also on the price differentials uh, and also the graph you, you show about the price, there's one line missing and that, that's the gray hydrogen, which is very much lower. It's not even the scale of the, of the graph. And that's where H2 Global is a great instrument uh, at this moment of the market to uh, fix that gap and, and to bridge that gap. And therefore, we're very happy to have this pilot auction because, like you say, it's not much money, but we need to learn how this will impact um, the, the projects and try to get them bankable and just scaling up. So we need more craziness. We need more leap of faith. This will go and turns into a, a hydrogen economy that is uh, profitable. But at this moment, uh, we all need to do our efforts to to try to make it work. Yeah. Right. This is this is great. Uh, thank you, Carla. I think you've uh, thrown in, you know, quite a few. I would say kind of a, like provocative thoughts here to kind of a trigger a further collective craziness, right? But like my, and you know, like you've, you've questioned essentially 20 million ton uh, targets of, of, of the European Union. I just wonder, you know, whether you are questioning more it on the domestic side when it comes to that 10 million or uh, import side. But as we are discussing import here, of course, I would like to to frame it like, let's say this is this is a target. You know, what what can we do, right? I mean, what actions are required to get to that target by 2030? I mean, there are many announced projects there. We know there are players who are on an extremely aggressive timeline to build those projects, uh, even by 2026, 2027. You know, with those projects coming online. So what is that that could miraculously happen, you know, let's say this year between now and Christmas is coming soon, uh, you know, that that could get us there. I mean, I'm just putting this to the panel. And um. Our main problem is fossil fuels are too cheap. Hmm. It is. That's the gap. So you're right. I think 20 million. I'm an optimist. But I just, I just can't see 20 million coming. And part of the problem is lead times. So do, do big projects at scale, they take 10 years. You've got three years of kind of scoping and feasibility. You've got another three years of development and, and financing and four years to construct. There's not much change out of that. You know, we've, um, you do medium-sized projects, it takes six to eight years, and here we are and it's 2024 tomorrow, and it's 2038, 2030 in six years' time. So I think we need to wake up and say, no, it's not possible. We've done quite a bit of work with other consultants and internally. I think 2035 we can do it. But then the best thing is to say, well, what happens if that actually comes in 2035? What does that do to the 1.5 target? Are we at three degrees? Are we at two? Hey, wake up, everyone. The answer is, I think, by the way, the, the um, H2 Global scheme is great. But it has to be funded, and it needs huge funding. So it's fantastic that it's moving, and it'll be tested. There is so much policy around at the moment, it's a bit hard to get your head around it. And it's all well-meaning, and it's all going in the right direction. And I've, uh, lots of opinion is coming out, and it's easier to trash this or trash that. But it shouldn't be trashed. It should be encouraged, and it needs to be tested. And actually, I think it will work. And I think it's going to push it. But the volumes need to go up. But they're not going to go up until they're kind of proven. We do need a time machine to go back 10 years and start then instead of now. But I think we're at 2035 when we start to hit the targets. If I may add to that, yeah, I completely agree. The price of uh, fo the fossil variant of hydrogen is too, too cheap. We need uh, a global CO2 price, uh, and therefore CBAM, that I think is going to help also push the, the cost uh, curve of uh, blue hydrogen 
even higher. So that's I don't think that's taking account into this calculation uh, for imports going into Europe, uh, because in that way we will favor green uh, against. Uh, so hydrogen is going to be part of CBAM, um, and then the CO2 price will have to be paid for hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen. You don't have the CO2, um, or at least uh, for the shipping part uh, only. Um, and then for blue hydrogen, it will just be too expensive to import. So that's very good that you bring this up, focus on what's good for the long term. Let's just focus on the renewable hydrogen, on green hydrogen, uh, and put the efforts that are needed there, um, and put a, a, a price on uh, on fossil variants, because yeah, it, it's just not a fair competition. We are just starting with uh, 10 points behind, so that's not fair. So, so Alexi, if I heard your qu question correctly, I think you were saying, what can we do by Christmas? So uh, <laughs> I, I think you were being a, a wee bit facetious, but you were. I, I think the the point is um, we've got to do something before we do everything, right? And so these early steps are really important to just not have the entire thing be uh, impractical because we can't do everything. But what what I think we can do is think about the problem on the European side, it's a, it's a, this is a logistics challenge as much as it is anything else, right? So we're, we're trying to do everything at once. We're trying to save the, uh, you know, the German uh, middle class and the industrial cap capacity. And we're trying to get um, the uh, Europe off of Russian natural gas. We're trying to do a million things at once that we can't do. What we can do is build projects that can deliver ammonia to a spot in which it can get blended into something that it's already using efficiently. So we're not cracking things back and moving it down through a pipe and trying to get it to some far away place and you know as soon as we build those pipes and we it's just not there. So we have to be efficient about what we do. The problem is that the things that we would blend into are commodities and they don't deliver any additional value. So if, if I, can't, I can't stop thinking about how what we do in aviation fuel applies to hydrogen. And we, we've been, we were, for years we were selling sustainable aviation fuel to uh, airlines. And airlines are very fuel sensitive and they provide more or less a commodity. They move people around from point A to point B. They can't pay additional money for that service, but the people in the seats can pay more. If you're, if you're a consulting firm, you're not providing a commodity, you are providing a specialty product, and that specialty product is not, the, the, your cost structure has nothing to do with what you pay for a flight from point A to point B. And so it, it, it feels to me that some of the innovation that we need to do to get this industry started is actually market innovation. How can we deliver the product efficiently to a port? Whether we blend it into to natural gas and power plants, or whether we blend it into uh, fertilizer applications, or even into refinery applications, whatever. Whatever we can do super efficiently. But then take the value of that decarbonization and apply it where it can have actual incremental value in, in, a, in a higher value way. And, and I don't know if we can do that. The, 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 the idea of, of book and claim and using ledger systems, still pretty new, there's still a lot of pushback. But we use ledger systems throughout everything we do. We, you know, we put our paychecks into a bank machine and then go to another country and we take money out. Well, it's not the same money. We use ledger systems and we believe in those ledger systems. I have to believe that part of the answer to how we get this thing started, and I really don't think it matters whether it's 2030 or 2035, those, those, we have to start and then we'll figure it all out. But I think part of the answer has to be in market mechanisms. I think you know, not the, the, the public sector doesn't only need to throw money at this problem. They need to throw innovation at this problem and, and, and enable these de this decarbonization to be applied in the most valuable way. So if you want to decarbonize steel so that it can go into de decarbonized high-end cars, do you really have to move the hydrogen all the way down to do that? Or could you have the displacement happen where it could happen efficiently and then have it be paid for at the steel mill, which is being fed by gas? 
Thank you, Jen. And uh, um, might be uh, a good news uh, to share here because you know the discussion I'm heading to after this conversation will be uh, the discussion about breakthrough agenda, and we are stepping in uh, to coordinate jointly with Clean Energy Ministerial. I mean, as RMI the demand creation for hydrogen uh, group which will be essentially linking the dots among various organizations that are leaning in and you know the angle of course that will be bringing into that coordination will be about uh, market-based uh, mechanisms go but, get them <laughs> um maybe uh claire you and then it will be good also to to hear uh, carla some some thoughts uh, from 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 you and you were with us in the round table in in in, in brussels and the only I mean, if I listen to this panel, right, the, clearly I hear the sense of urgency, right? But I didn't quite have that sense of urgency in the round table that we had with the policymakers uh, on, 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 on the EU side, including, right? I mean, it, it all sounded like, yeah, that's fine, you know, we will, we'll get there eventually. Yeah, maybe import from, you know, US, maybe from somewhere else. There was no that kind of a sense of urgency that at least that was my main takeaway that, you know, we hear in this discussion. But first, Claire, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I want to pick up on something that Carla mentioned, which was the comparison of costs to that of fossil fuel. But it's important to remember that in addition to the benefits of green hydrogen being decarbonization, Green hydrogen also, you know, provides stability, price stability, and the ability to lock in a 20-year fixed price of a zero-carbon product allows then the demand. We go back to how do we give the demand confidence that's needed. That price stability gives that confidence to then FID um, on the on the, the project side. Um, and then I just wanted to pick up, too, on, on the sense of urgency that, you know, this goes back to what Alex was saying. It, it's not just, you know, we're not just talking CapEx. That's the CapEx fig figures are, are bonkers, but the timelines to build these. And so, you know, well, well, we, we called ourselves crazy. I think the lack of urgency is, is actually the crazy. Yeah. Yeah, let me react to that. But I do feel personally the lack, not not the lack of urgency. I think also the European Union has shown with repower, with the Green Deal, a lot of ambition. So yeah. the, the ambition is there, and the instruments are being put in place. Um, if if you see how much funding has been unlocked the last year from the public sector for this for hydrogen, it's just unprecedented. There's no other sector that this has been done. I think the expectations were a bit higher on the yeah. On the, on the private side that this would be enough for, to unlock the investments but clearly it's not and maybe that's just a, yeah, a reality check that has to come for, from Europe it is, is if this is not enough what else can be done and maybe you can think of other systems, this what you mentioned is related to certification if it's going to be a mass balance system or a book and claim system uh, there are ongoing discussions that mainly now looking at not exactly what you're suggesting but the other system um, so yeah you, you need to see in the, the whole uh, picture what is going to lead to a more cost-effective co2 reduction uh, and I think that has to be the driver in all the policy decisions and um, uh, yeah for Europe it will be definitely important to import uh, and the, um, at least from the Netherlands our strategy is to have a diversification of origin so the US is a very trusted partner we have all, also other countries where we we trust very much in energy relations and we find this very important we don't want to become again just uh, very independent of one country or one region so it's very important uh, and also for the development of new parts of the world to become really um, uh, yeah, developed and energy providers that it also contributes to the local benefits. If you have these large-scale uh, projects, you can finance in the end also the local decarbonization. So it, it's a, we see it as a win-win situation um, and therefore we hope to strengthen the relations with uh, a lot of 
countries. We already have 14 MOUs with a lot of, we're working with a lot of governments, uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, of, uh, as a first mover, we have uh, more experience in uh, several things about reutilization of infrastructure. So a lot of countries are coming to us to ask, yeah, how is this being done? Do we have technical uh, assistance. Um, and, and that's also valuable, not only subsidizing projects, but also sharing uh, the best practices in the and what's not going good to not reply it elsewhere where things are starting. So I think that's how we can contribute and that's uh, what I see the sentiment, especially uh, Northwest European countries. Susanna, any uh, last thoughts from you? And we are almost at time. Uh, no, just super brief. I just wanted to um, make sure that uh, people are aware that as part of the process of this, that we are organizing with this auction, it's not just, I mean, the ultimate goal is not just to have the funds to make, to pay for this difference and bridge the, the gap, which obviously is the ultimate goal. But the whole process meant that through this, we had to design what the contracts would look like and what are the safeguards that needed to be uh, created. So there's a series of measures that came with the whole process of trying to organize the auction, which I think will be also very useful for the future market development because it, it starts to create some standard version of like, okay, this 10-year offtake agreement or or other aspects of it that will make it easier for other, other opportunities to emerge that could be commercial. It doesn't mean that necessarily all of them will have to receive money th through this mechanism, but it's creating some conditions in addition uh, that will help help the market flourish. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are now on time. And I would like to, well, and not that many marathoners who, who came, you know, stayed. I think it's, uh, it's uh, I appreciate it. It's, we are moving towards the dinner here. But I oh, just want to appreciate the, the quality of this, uh, of this panel. I mean, this is exactly, in my view, the discussions that we need uh, to have. And you don't quite often hear this, you know, sharpness and precision in, a, in the discussions when you go to the big conferences. And I've been to quite a few this year. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, thank all the panelists, um, you know, for, for, for this discussion, for openness. And, uh, well, hopefully, you know, next year we will meet not here in a different place and we will make a tangible uh, uh, progress toward creating demand and towards scaling up uh, this, this industry because it's a truly exciting time. And we shouldn't forget, you know, how, how big was the distance that we've covered even in the last couple of years in, in, in this industry. I think that's a good point actually. And to f finish on something more optimistic, lead times are long. The targets are enormous. I think you touched on it. What a wonderful thing it would be to have a global carbon price to level the playing field. I actually am optimistic and I'm going to go out there and say within the next five years, you're going to see that starting to really emerge. Europe's already there. I mean, if we read the history books, somewhere just after the global financial crisis, the whole thing went to jelly. It was starting to head in the right direction for carbon pricing. And if that was in place, this would be flying now. Right. And you would be looking at countries and saying, do you want industry? Well, you need to go down this clean route. Do you want to have ships and aeroplanes and what have you? the green fuels would be the only way to go. We've somewhere lost 15 years. It's sad, but we've got to pick it up. And it's really hard when you're running hard, but you can see the target disappearing, but you've got to keep running. Anyway, en enough said. Did and this year has been... Or? <laughs> But this, this year has been good in so many ways, and I think next year is, is going to be very interesting. Sorry. All right, keep, keep on running. Shall we uh, do the photo or? I think we should.